much. Uh, so hello and welcome to another session of ICIE Talks. Uh, today's topic is Pedagogies of the Possible, and our esteemed guest and speaker is Vlad Galvinu uh, from Webster University in Geneva. Hello, hello, hi, hi everyone. Okay, oh, so I will give a little go. background. <laughs> <laughs> so Professor Glavinu is an associate professor at and head of Department of Psychology and Professional Counseling, director of the Webster Center for Creativity and Innovation at Webster University, Geneva, Switzerland, and associate professor at the University of Bergen, Norway. His work develops a social cultural understanding of creativity and has been published in over 150 articles and chapters. Vlad is the author of the book, Distributed Creativity, editor of the Creativity Reader, and currently editor of Palgrave Encyclopedia of the Possible to be Completed in 2021. Okay, so with us today is also Professor Taisir Yamin. He is a general director of International Center for Innovation and Education, and he will tell you a little bit more about today's focus. Okay, thank you so much, Nana. So today we would like to thank uh, my friend, uh, Vlad Glavano. Uh, so uh, I think this is the spelling I learned from him. Uh, this talk is going to talk about or to address the possibilities uh, for being cultivated and or by, uh, are being cultivated. On the contrary, uh, hindered in the process of schooling, uh, the notion of pedagogies of the possible refers in this context to those forms of education that make us sensitive to differences in perspectives and cultivate reflective dialogues among them. In proposing this notion, he is building on the psychology and philosophy of a diverse group of thinkers. Uh, of course, based on uh, Vygotsky, uh, Dewey, uh, Freyer, and uh, Jerome Pruner, uh, he argued that possibility should be placed at the center of education, and he will discuss the many opportunities, but also the challenges associated with uh, developing such uh, pedagogies inside and outside the classroom. And uh, Vlad is uh, uh, very active in this field of knowledge, and he uh, already published a large number of articles and edited a number of books, and also he was the single author of a number of them. So anybody interested, you can just Google uh, Vlad uh, uh, and you will find uh, there is a huge number of uh, contributions. Also, uh, he is uh, frequently contributing to our journal and our uh, activities, including our conferences. He has been as a keynote speaker in a number of uh, conferences. So you see here, there is uh, three uh, titles. I choose also two another uh, or another two titles, very interesting books, uh, as you see, uh, and also uh, these other two. So uh, this is how we will proceed. First of all, uh, we will give the uh, platform to my friend Vlad to uh, introduce his topic. And after that, uh, Nana will uh, coordinate uh, the discussion uh, session, which comes immediately after uh, this talk. So uh, the platform is yours, Vlad. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tazir, Nana, and everyone who, who is here with us today. I'm, I'm really happy to be talking to you about a topic that has been obsessing me for a little while. So it's it's nice to um, to exchange and to exercise these uh, these. Um, these demons. Uh, so I'm gonna share. I'm gonna share my slides, and I think Tazir already beat me to it, in telling you a little bit more about about possibility. But just to make a, another another short introduction. So um, 
perhaps you know, for those of you who 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 know me a little bit, you know that I'm I've been working on the sociocultural approach to creativity. So a lot of my work for the past decade or so has been focused on understanding creativity as a social process. And by this, I mean two things. On the one hand, uh, I'm very much interested in how social interaction, social relations, culture, cultural resources become part of the creative process. They're not just added to it, but, but they're, they're effectively a part of, of how we create. And on the other hand, I'm interested in how creativity uh, contributes to society. So placing creativity back into society. And it is from these two sides of the same interest, if you want, that uh, very recently, or well, kind of, it, it's been already about three, four years, I became interested in this idea of the possible. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit uh, further about what the possible means for me. Obviously it's a very rich uh, category. A lot of people talk about it in, in psychology, in philosophy, uh, in many other disciplines, and of course in education. I mean, we, uh, we, we saw in the, in the brief abstract I proposed, if you think about Paulo Freire, if you, if you think about Jerome Bruner or Lev Vygotsky, I think all of them articulate certain views of um, education as possibility expanding, or at least meant to be possibility expanding. And uh, as Tazir already mentioned and, and uh, kindly you know, showed some, some of my, the, the book covers of um, some recent, recent books, um, I'm, I'm shamelessly putting, <laughs> putting forward these two, uh, two books as well, because this is where I, I mostly concentrated my ideas until now on the possible, which is, you know, my, my approach would be a sociocultural approach to it, and related to it, this, um, this idea of wonder and wondering, which for me is a process that is kind of holds the key to how we often can access the possible in our lives. And uh, because Tazir was kind enough to invite me for different conferences and different, I've, I've given different talks in the past, I'm pretty sure I gave one on wonder, maybe I, I've given some workshops as well. So I thought I, I take you with me on the journey to the heart of this interest of mine, which I can only formulate as pedagogies of the possible. How can we envision, create and practice pedagogies that explicitly cultivate human possibility? And I need to tell you from, from the start as well that I'm working with a number of colleagues uh, on this topic. Most notably uh, would be um, uh, Ron Baghetto from Arizona State University. And uh, he and I, we have uh, some, some papers uh, on, on, this, um, on this topic that I'm happy to share with you later. And even recently, we, we proposed a book on pedagogies of the possible with uh, Cambridge University Press, and I, I think hopefully will be approved. So maybe even more, more will come. And I'd be very happy to, of course, hear your thoughts and, and receive feedback because this is really work, uh, work in progress. So where, where does it all begin? I, I guess as a creativity researcher, I've always been fascinated by how people are capable to bring about meaningful novelties in their life and in the life of other people. Because remember, I'm, I'm very much looking at, looking at creativity as a sociocultural phenomenon, not only a psychological one. And what is behind this capacity? You know, for me, it is an awareness of new possibilities and a way of enacting some of those possibilities, right? Through creative action. So what I became interested in very, very much is this idea using a Heideggerian notion that the idea of dwelling of the way in which we dwell within the possible in our everyday life. I mean, if you think about it, and I, I think the pandemic is showing us uh, quite an extreme case of, of this phenomenon, you know, if we didn't have the capacity to look beyond our immediate conditions, which for many of us sadly are quite dire with, the, with, with everything that is going on with the lockdowns and the, the death toll and, and everything. If we didn't have this capacity to escape, if you want, sometimes our immediate life circumstances and imagine, envision different, different futures, um, you know, imagine or remember, uh, you know, moments, happier moments or, or moments when we were with other people. And if we weren't able to use this in order to to kind of create new meaning in our life about this stage, about what is happening now, we wouldn't be able to move forward. So dwelling within the possible is something we do on a daily basis. We do it every time. I mean, some of you right now might be thinking, you know, what will I have for dinner later? That is one way of dwelling <laughs> into possibilities. Some of you might be thinking, what does it even mean, you know, to include the possible in education? That's yet another way 
of exploring, you know, mentally exploring, thinking about and playing with ideas uh, uh, around what could be. So, um, you know, if, if we look at education in particular, and this is what Ron and I have been writing about for a little while, we can distinguish between pedagogies of sameness and what, you know, anticipating, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm calling with him pedagogies of difference. We're all very familiar with what pedagogies of sameness uh, are about. I mean, the, the cartoon, this very famous cartoon, I'm, I'm sure you came across it. I constantly use it in my teaching um, of a teacher looking at a, at a set of potential students, if you want, you know, there are different animals there and saying, um, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. So the teacher here, I mean, this, this plays on evolutionary theory as well, right? And, and how mankind kind of looks at the natural world and, and the, way, uh, the way we look at evolution. But it applies a lot to how we do testing in education and, and what we expect of people. Because uh, at the core of it, pedagogies of sameness mean that students are expected to do more or less the same thing more or less at the same time, in similar ways, and especially arrive at the same outcomes. And this is something that is deeply ingrained within the, the curriculum uh, of, of many classrooms and many schools across the world. And it's something that also comes back when we look at how uh, teachers design their classrooms, right? Designing with the end in mind, we often hear that, which is a way of saying, think about your objective and then work back what steps students need to take to reach that objective. Now, there is no particular problem with, with thinking about outcomes. Obviously, we, we always have to think about outcomes. The challenge becomes, or the issue becomes, when these outcomes are rather rigid. They're all more or less predetermined. You know, teachers enter the classroom knowing what they would want ideally to get when they get out of the classroom, if you want. And also in the way we do assessment, which is, is very standardized, obviously, we really try to guide students to really mold them into the same form, if you want. And if we go back to Paulo Freire, for instance, you, you might remember that he talked extensively about this uh, metaphor of banking, you know, education as banking. When you make mental deposits in the minds of students, you know, you, you, you decide what students should know and learn, and basically you ingrain within them a certain view of the world, a certain view of society, and, and that's how you form them as citizens. But what's missing here is the capacity of these students to think on their own, to, to be able to question, first of all, what you're depositing within their minds, and even to be agentic enough to kind of guide their own education process to some extent. So what happens within the, the framework of pedagogies of sameness is that obviously differences will never be able to be completely eradicated from the classroom because we are, first of all, we're all different as human beings and we'll, we will all approach a certain problem or situation from slightly different angles, right? So students will have this natural impulse of bringing up differences in the way they think, in, in, in what connections they make, in the way they feel as well in the classroom. The issue is that when we apply these pedagogies of sameness, what teachers look at when they see a difference, they think of it in terms of a misunderstanding or an error. Everything that is different becomes a little bit of noise on the path to that objective that, that, that you know, is being wanted and, and established. So when approaching differences, very often teachers uh, want to address or correct them in order for students to all go on the, on the pre-established path. Now, I don't want to be overly stereotypical. Obviously, obviously not all teachers do that. Obviously teachers don't do that with, with every single lesson. We, we have a lot of examples and I'm, I'm sure many of the teachers here right now listening to my talk would think of the many ways in which they actually try to bring about differences in the classroom, right? So we, we all work within the, the other pedagogy of difference as well. But we have to acknowledge that above teachers, you have this school administration and, and you have these uh, educational systems very often that push, push us effectively into standardization. Because if we don't achieve, if our students don't achieve, you know, at the, on, on the test at the end, then our own teaching might be questioned and, and the school itself might be questioned. So there is a deeper, a deeper kind of pressure there. 
Now, what I call, and, and you know, with Ron and others, we're thinking about as pedagogies of difference are basically all these ways of educating that bring to the fore the fact there is an intrinsic diversity within each and every classroom. Now, some of the most exciting and meaningful and powerful, I think, pedagogical encounters are found exactly in this space of difference that creates some kind of, of, of uncertainty that opens, a, opens the classroom up to something that is less expected. It's, it's not predetermined. It is in many ways unexpected. Difference creates novelty, right? And, and, and the, one of the most rewarding experiences for you as a teacher and for me, I, I, you know, I want on reflection, is when I learn something from the class I'm giving. I learn something from, from the process of teaching. I learn something from my students. This is only possible if me as a teacher or, or you as teachers are sensitive to a different point of view. Right, so differences exist throughout the classroom. There, there is a difference between, you know, how we did education in the past, how we're doing it now, how we're going to do it in the 21st century moving forward. There is a difference between the technologies we used to use and the technologies we have today. Um, the, 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 there are so many. There, there are differences, you know, between the the, the languages to, uh, students might speak. So many differences, but. One of the, the core types of differences that I'm particularly interested in are differences of opinion, differences of point of view, differences of knowledge, of background, and even of worldview, differences in the way students approach life itself. And these can be extremely fruitful if and when we are ready to meet difference with dialogue instead of meeting it with corrective uh, you know, kind of strategies, as I mentioned before, this idea that that uh, Freire and others and, and Jerome Brunner as well talked about, instead of closing up and, and creating a monological space of the classroom where only one point of view, the point of view of the teacher should dominate. If we allow ourselves to enter in dialogue, you know, in a Bakhtinian sense, which means that we need to respect and, and kind of try to grasp the position of the other, we will be fundamentally kind of changing the way we do education. Dialogue is not meant to make differences disappear. Dialogue doesn't mean that at the end, we all have to reach the same conclusion. Again, especially the conclusion of the teacher, the, the one that is meant to be uh, the, the final conclusion of the class. But dialogue means using differences to expand possibilities, possibilities for thinking and for action um, uh, for, for the students and, and for the teacher as well. So. For us, ped pedagogies of the possible relate a lot to the ways in which we are sensitive to discover differences and, and what we make of them in everyday um, practices of education. But if we dig a little bit further, you know, I'm, I'm talking about opening up possibilities, exploring the possible. What does that mean? I mean, there are at least four ways in which we engage with the possible. And, and this is by no means an, an exhaust, uh, exhaustive um, kind of uh, typology. The, one of the dominant ways is by thinking what could be. So instead of focusing only on what is the case, we open up to what could be the case, you see? So this is something that children often do, especially young children in pretend play. They look at an object, you know, a, let's say a, a pencil of sorts, and they imagine that, that it could be a hammer or a weapon, or, or I, I, I don't know, maybe a syringe now that we're all taking vaccines, right? So the, the identity of the pencil as a pencil does not disappear. Children are not confused as to what this is, but they, they look at it and they treat it and they act on it as if it was something else. This is the capacity to explore the possible that is brought up by, by engaging with what could be than not only with what is. This is a fundamental way in which we enrich our own existence, you know, because we bring into the experience of, of now things that are outside of it. If I have a pencil, you know, if a child has a pencil, but they imagine a submarine as, as being this pencil, I don't know, the, the children's imagination, and imagination can, can be quite, quite rich. Then they bring in the notion of a submarine and everything associated with that within their life experience. How else could they do it? They can't really be around a submarine, you know, unless God knows how they got near a submarine. But but by by playing and by imagining and by engaging with what could be, 
they expand their mental horizon in many ways. Now, a second, a second way in which we explore the possible is by looking at what is to come. And the future for a long, long time has been the privileged domain of possibility. In many ways, it is the future that is always open and indeterminate. It, it, you know, I mean, the, the pandemic has shown us that it is indeterminate. One of the reasons none of us can be sure about what we're going to do in June or July is because the future is indeterminate. It's open, you know, it's still open. And it's open in this terrifying way, if you think of the pandemic, but it's open also in a wonderful way. If you think about a child or a student thinking about what they could become in life, right? So engaging with what is to come, trying to engage with the future is, is a fundamental way of, of exploring the possible, of exploring possibilities. But there is more than the future that we can play with in this manner. The past can also be a domain of possibility, which is a bit of a counterintuitive idea, especially if you think that the past is what, what already happened. You know, what possibility is there in things that already happened? Well, what might have been is a way of thinking. In, in psychology, we call it counterfactual thinking. You know, you think against the facts. There, there are some facts, but, but you imagine them differently and you create scenarios. What if it would have happened like this? What if that would have happened, right? So this is another very powerful tool we have to, to infuse possibility into the past in order to learn from, from that exercise. So when people have you know, a, lucky, a lucky break in life and then they start thinking, well, what were the many ways in which I might not have been lucky? Do you see? So they, they play with possibilities around what happened. What if I did not encounter that person? What, did, what if, I, if I didn't say that thing? They play with possibilities related to the past. And what they reach through that is a deeper, more complex understanding of where they are now and maybe what is to come into the future. And finally, the possible is obviously uh, um, a, a area of relative freedom. You know, when we look also only at what is the case, at the real or the actual, if you want. And, and by the way, I don't want to dichotomize this too much because the, the possible grows out of the actual and the real and, and it infuses them with new meanings. So it's, it's, they're not radically separate. I, I don't want to suggest that. But if, if we contrast you know, possibility with what is, we notice that we have freedom, a freedom to imagine what is not the case. We can imagine things that did not happen or cannot happen or can never happen. In the possible, in the realm of the possible, we can imagine beings and encounters and phenomena that cannot logically and physically exist. That's how we have, you know, we have um, unicorns and mermaids and all sorts of, of fantastic, fabulous creatures um, because we can through uh, through possibility, through exploring possibility, we can open up this whole new area of our existence, which is what is not and what might never be. We can still think and, and kind of act uh, on that. So exploring possibility invites students and teachers to move around all of these ways of, of thinking and doing things. What if thinking, as if thinking, what else thinking, you know, what might have been kind of thinking. All of these need to be cultivated in a, in a pedagogy that is, is open to possibility. And very often we, you know, we talk about creativity because I, I do have to talk about creativity. It is still my, my, uh, my kind of uh, main road into possibility. And very often we think about creative action in the classroom as action that, that guides uh, students to, to engage with all of these different, different things. But we do have a problem, I, I think. I mean, now I'm, I'm gonna be a little bit controversial perhaps. We do have a problem with the fundamental way in which we think about creativity. Some of you might know that there is a, a paper circulating about the standard definition of creativity uh, uh, by, by two colleagues. And um, they do this wonderful historical uh, analysis of different definitions. And they come back to point to the fact that Stain in, in 1953, gave the field uh, one of the most iconic and, and, and kind of well-used uh, definitions of it, which is essentially a product definition of creativity. So many times when we define creativity, through the very definition we use, we point back to the person doing the creating and especially to the features of the outcome that is being created, 
And Stein said at the time, let us start with the definition. The creative work is a novel work that is accepted as tenable or useful or satisfying by a group in some point in time. So this is already a wonderful addition, by the way. We often forget to say by a group at some point in time, right? In, 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 in the way we think about creativity uh, 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 in, in, um, in our research or practice, we often focus much more on these two criteria, novelty and originality, and then usefulness, meaningfulness, uh, appropriateness, and, and so on. And Stein went on, by novel, I mean that the creative product did not exist previously in precisely the same form. The extent to which a work is novel depends on the extent to which it deviates from the traditional or the status quo. This is what we would call uh, originality. This may well depend on the nature of the problem that is attacked, the fund of knowledge or experience that exists in the field at the time, and the characteristics of the creative individual. So we, we look back at also the, the creative person and those of the individuals with whom he or she is communicating. So by, by critiquing a little bit this focus on the outcome, I'm not saying, by the way, that we should throw it out of the window, just that I'm not saying by critiquing how in education we focus so much on predetermined outcomes and on standardization that we need absolutely no notion of where we want to get to or no, no pedagogical ideal or, you know, planning or goal, goal setting. We need all of these, but we need to transform the way we think about that, uh, about them. And with creativity, a relatively easy way to do that is to integrate person and outcome within a wider understanding of process and experience. And this is what uh, Ron and I have been uh, writing about. We, we published actually a commentary to, to the paper on the, the standard definition of creativity, and we called it creative experience a non-standard definition. So we, you know, we, we were trying to be a bit polemical there. But the, the core idea here is that in education, we should focus much more on cultivating creative experiences. It's not only the outcomes. I mean, outcomes are very important. They're part of the experience itself. But if we focus as teachers only on what comes at the end and, and whether it's novel enough, whether it's original enough, it's useful enough and so on and so forth, we're missing out on how students reached that outcome. That is in, in many ways the most important part of the, of the process. And we're missing out on the experience they had you know, engaging with possibility in that way. So our working definition of creative experience involves a principled engagement with the unfamiliar and a willingness to approach the familiar in unfamiliar ways. So already we're trying to, you, you can notice to shift a bit the usual vocabulary. We talk so much in, in creativity uh, research about novelty and, and originality and all of that. Of course, they're very important, but how about we infuse the field with new concepts, you know, unfamiliarity, the, the relation between the familiar and unfamiliar. Can we play with that within creative experience? So for us, just, you know, to come, come to the core, a creative experience can be defined as a novel person-world encounter grounded in meaningful actions and interactions, which are marked by the principles of, and here we have four principles, open-endedness, non-linearity, pluriperspectives, and future orientation. And these are really the four pillars on which we believe, you know, we can build more creative classrooms and, and we can build pedagogies of the possible. And I'm going to go in turn to, to discuss each one of them and, and how they might be um, reflected in, in education. So what does open-endedness mean in the end, right? It's everything I, I, I said about pedagogies of sameness as driving us towards the same outcome or a clear outcome. With open-endedness, you allow the surprise to happen in the classroom. You allow the fact that the end might not be the end of the discussion, the conclusion or the provisional conclusion might not be what you have envisioned. You, it's not exactly where maybe you expected the thing to go, the conversation to go. How can we cultivate open-endedness? Well, these are just a few suggestions. I'm, I'm sure there are many more, and I, I would love to, to listen to you at the end with, uh, with your own suggestions and view, views on this. But one of them is asking unknown questions. So what does an unknown question mean? It doesn't mean that you don't know the question. You don't know the answer to the question. As teachers, very often, we have the tendency, teachers ask an, uh, an enormous number of questions. You know, on the surface, when you ask questions, you stimulate curiosity and wonder, and, and you, you are open, you know, you, you invite 
contributions. That's why you ask a question. But in reality, teachers ask questions that they know how to answer. And, and they want the students to also know how to answer them. That is most of the times why questions are being asked. So what would it mean to ask a question that you do not know how to answer as a teacher, right? It is quite destabilizing. It is quite scary, if you want, you know, just frankly, because we were used to trying to be in control. This is part of the teacher education, you know, um, element of we need to always be in control of the classroom, in control of the, the discipline. But showing that you yourself don't know an answer to something doesn't mean it's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of inviting people to work together with, with you to kind of, of, of explore that particular topic. So one, one powerful way of cultivating open-endedness is to ask some questions that you don't know how to answer, you know, have the, 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 the courage to do that. The second one is to accept not knowing. I mean, it's very much related to, to, the, to the first part, but if you think about it in education, the main value we follow is knowledge. And, and that's not bad, of course. I mean, knowledge is so precious. We, we look today at the state of the world. We look at the war on science, the, the, the emergence of post-truth in many ways and fake news and all of that. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is sanity. Uh, we need knowledge. I'm, I'm not advocating against that. But what I'm trying to bring in is also the value of not knowing in a Socratic sense, you know, Socrates was obviously one of the, the fathers of philosophy, you know, uh, philosophia, love of wisdom. He said that philosophy begins in wonder and wonder begins in not knowing. The moment you know, you've ended that conversation, you've ended the, the inquiry, it's over, you know, you know, that's it, you, you've got your answer. But what about not knowing? Can not knowing be a productive, fertile, you know, state in, in the classroom? Can, can not knowing be accepted as something valuable? It's not like everyone needs to go into a classroom and say, we don't know anything, no one knows anything, so what's the point of this? It's not about nihilism or skepticism or anything like that. It's really being able to withhold moments and to contain you know, moments in which it is okay not to know the answer. It's okay to hypothesize and to imagine and, and to discuss. Another, another useful tool here to cultivate open-endedness is improvisation, obviously. You know, going a bit off the script. You don't have to always plan every single unit or, or, or try to design every component of an educational experience. You can allow yourself to improvise. And improvising means, first of all, addressing problems as they come. And second of all, working with the classroom. You know, improvisation very often is a collective experience. And, and we have many people like Sawyer and Montori and others who worked on improvisation in, in um, uh, theater groups, in jazz bands and so on. We can learn so much from them in the classroom. You know, you create a, 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 a state of collective flow when students and teachers together are excited about pursuing a certain idea, a certain conversation, and they improvise around it. And uh, lesson and planning is, is something that Ron, uh, Ron Baghetto talks more about, is this idea that, you know, a lesson by definition is something we plan and when we have a curriculum and we have objectives and we have, you know, steps of the lesson, it's all fine, you know, we, we need scaffolding, we need some structure, but we can also unplan specific parts of our lesson, just components of our lesson, we don't need not to teach students X, Y, and Z. But we can allow certain freedom and flexibility and open-endedness for one of these components or for the way in which we get to that component. Do you see what I mean? So it's not about unplanning every lesson and no more plans, throw them out the window. No, it's about having a plan, having a vision, but allowing within that plan moments of unplanned spontaneity, you know, welcoming, welcoming that open-endedness. Nonlinearity, you know, the second principle. So how do we encourage nonlinearity? Nonlinearity non means that we should not look at educational processes and, and, you know, by extension, creative processes by, you know, essentially as linear processes. You know, we have in the creativity literature a lot of linear models of creativity, uh, preparation, incubation, illumination, verification. Of course, Wallace didn't believe that they always have to go A, B, C, D, but this is the implication for many people that, that you have to go through these stages to, to create. In reality, if you look at the details of the creative process, it is a back and forth, forth uh, cyclical, iterative type of movement in which we go in multiple directions. We don't just go from A to B. 
So how can we infuse this aspect of nonlinearity in the classroom? Well, one way is to, is to, to acknowledge and admit and, and just make it a principle that mistakes are good, mistakes are okay. You know, we can fail, it's okay to fail. It's okay to say something wrong even something silly, right? And, and, and this is something, you know, revolutionary again for the classroom because in a classroom, students know they're gonna be penalized for mistakes. They're gonna, you're gonna have a lower grade, they're gonna be points taken off. So they avoid to say anything often just because they, they can't say the right thing. So already saying that mistakes, you know, and failure are accepted troubles this, this linearity of, I'm telling you what to do, you get to do it, you know? you know, we, we need to find ways to, to, um, to sometimes mess up in a way, you know, mess with, if you want, rather than mess up the, the, the linearity of the process. Another, another way, very simply, is to accept that there are multiple ways of getting to the same goal. So if by the end of the classroom, I want my students to understand what truth is, or what democracy is, or, or whatever, why, why we need to wear masks and get a vaccine, I need to accept that I have a certain argument but there are so many other arguments that can be created, right? So I can get to the same goal through so many different pathways. How do I cultivate? How do I, how do I accompany students on these different pathways? Then uh, again, uh, Ron talks about in, in his work as well about creative openings. Creative openings, uh, similar to what I said about lesson and planning, are these moments within the classroom where you notice that a very different idea has been expressed. And what, what teachers tend to do when that happens is to immediately close it up, to either correct it or, or to just, you know, move on and, and, and to say, okay, well, I, I want to hear something else. Give me another idea because it's not what I expected. How can, we, how can we make an educational kind of experience, a creative experience around that moment of openness, creative openness, when something radically different has been mentioned, you know? And, uh, and finally, structured uncertainty. So this is again what, what Ron is also talking about with um, his, his working a lot nowadays on uncertainty. And structured uncertainty is basically uh, a bit of an oxymoron, right? Because if it's structured, can it be uncertain? Well, it's, it's exactly pointing to that fact that we shouldn't think in black and white terms. Uh, inviting uncertainty in the classroom doesn't mean throwing everything out the window and, and, and all of a sudden having nothing planned, no, no expectation and nothing will happen if we do that. But having a rigid structure will definitely restrain and hinder creative expression and possibility. So we need the middle ground. We need to structure moments of uncertainty, right? So we need, we need to have an optimum, an optimum uh, balance between structure and, and uncertainty, including uncertainty that we experience as, as teachers. Pluriperspectivism. So how do we get to having in the classroom a variety of perspectives? How do we open the classroom up to a variety of diversity of points of view? One very simple way is to cultivate empathy and perspective taking. Can we help students look at the world and look at the problem through the eyes of their colleagues, through the eyes of other people? You know, can they look at the problem through my eyes as a teacher? And can I, as a teacher, look at my classroom and my, you know, the problems through the eyes of my students. So already cultivating perspective taking is, is an amazingly effective uh, mechanism for, for, for the pedagogies I'm explaining here. Then allowing for dialogical experiences. So here, the, the word dialogical, I'm, I'm building a lot on um, Mikhail Bakhtin and, and his, uh, his view of dialogism, which is this idea that voices, different voices, to, to maintain a dialogue between different voices is to maintain tension between them. We often avoid tension in human interactions, especially in the classroom. We do not want tension, right? Because tension means that uh, there, there could be conflict, uh, someone might get hurt in a way, you know, emotionally. Uh, tension is not generally something good. But for the purpose of creativity and possibility, in, in these voices that are in dialogue, it's good to point to tensions. It's good to point to moments when you can't really say A and B at the same time. So what do we do with that, right? So in a dialogical encounter, in a dialogical experience, you build on tension. And, and your aim is not to solve every tension. At the end of the class, everyone needs to be friends with everyone else. We all hold hands. We all believe the same thing. Definitely not. Maintaining the tension, maintaining that, kernel of tension maintains curiosity as well, you know, and it's the bridge towards a new experience, a new creative experience later. 
then we can uh, we can think about delaying closure. You know, we uh, again often in education we uh, we we love having a very neat uh, kind of experience whereby we uh, we kind of close off the the lesson. You know, we 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 immediately tell the conclusion and everyone goes happy. And you know that we train students, poor students, we train them foreclosure because you often hear i guarantee you and, and probably you're going to you're going to remember as well you often hear students come to you and say so what exactly is the conclusion of the less the lesson what 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 do i need to write down as the 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 you know the truth and the fact about it we train them to get the the answer the one correct answer I'm not saying here that you should not tell students what the conclusion is. We have so many conclusions to share with them that that's not the problem, but not immediately closing off any kind of topic and, 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 and possible conversation by just going to the, the final answer. You know, this is the conclusion. This is what you need to take away. No, just enjoy the, the journey to the conclusion. You know, it's not only about the conclusion. And finally, in, in this category, building on life experience, there is so much life experience in the classroom. I know that our students, depending on who you teach, if you teach very young, uh, young children, uh, you know, they, uh, they, they don't have as much life experience but they do have some life experience. If you look around, every student comes with their own concerns and worries and passions and talents and you know, interests. How can we build on that? How can we infuse the classroom you know, with, with these, these different possibilities that, that, that we already have in the classroom? And finally, uh, something about future orientation, I'm gonna stop after because I, I would love to, to hear some, some ideas from you. So um, a lot of education is about the past. You know, it's not only the history lesson that is about the past very often, but a lot of what we teach in physics, mathematics, everywhere, it's about what has been said, what has been done. It's, it's a lot about bringing the past to, to, to kind of using the present, if you want, right? What about the future? I mean, the pandemic and, and everything all, the, you know, the, the century we're living through shows us that the jobs of tomorrow, what, what our students might be confronted with tomorrow, we have no idea today. So we're preparing them by, by bringing all this past experience for what we know is happening now, but tomorrow it might be a completely different world that they have to deal with. How can we orient education towards the future, towards an open future, right? So one, one idea is to encourage already students to think about multiple futures. It's not only that the most likely thing to happen is X. It's not only prediction. It's not only forecast, but it's what people in the anticipation literature call foresight. Foresight is when you de develop multiple scenarios about what might happen. So inviting this kind of multiplicity. Then what you can do is focus their attention on complex challenges, the pandemic, the migration crisis, the climate emergency, right? These are all extremely complex challenges. And you know what? They're unfolding in time. And, and, and when you deal with them, you necessarily have to think about the future. You need to think about what will happen next. Otherwise, you cannot understand them. You cannot properly you know, engage with them. Another part which is, which is quite interesting, at, at least for me, is to think about how we can bring in utopias back to the classroom. You know, when you think of utopias, you think of, of fantasy and you know, something that is completely irrelevant to, to the world because an utopia is utopos, is, is nowhere. An, an utopia is, is nowhere to be found. So why, why do we even talk about that? Of course, we need to talk about that because the society we, be, we live in you know, thrives on utopias. We, we as human beings, again, going back to living in, dwelling in the possible, we anchor our lives on all of these ideals about what society should be like and how we should live. We might never achieve them fully, but they're the motivation, they're the drive to go on, right? Think about social change and, 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 and um, social movements nowadays. They're fueled by utopian thinking. Think about how teenagers around the world with, with Greta and, and others, you know, got activated by the climate, uh, climate uh, debate and, and climate emergency. This is also an example of utopian thinking, but they had to go outside of the classroom in many ways and, and you know, get mobilized and do things outside to make that point. Why can't we do that in education, inside the classroom? And finally, cultivating responsibility. When you cultivate pedagogies of the possible, when you, you foster creativity, when you help students get oriented towards the future and, and, and open towards the future, 
you need to take into account what that future will do to them and to other people. You need to have an ethic, ethical, you know, an ethics kind of compass to help them navigate these multiple futures that I talked about. Yes, the world could go in many, many directions, but not all of them will be good. Not all of them would be ethical. Not all of them would be wise. So cultivating responsibility is kind of this final piece uh, that I'm proposing to you as, as a kind of a, a color, color, corollary, excuse me, of, of uh, what it means to, um, to, uh, to design and to, to enact pedagogies of the possible. And I think I'm going to stop here because I've, I've talked way too much. And, uh, and I, I really want to hear from you if any of this resonates with what you're thinking about and, and your concerns. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I think what uh, we will do is I will ask one question from the chat and then we will open up to one person who wants to make a comment and then we will go back to the chat and then just do it in that way. Um, so be prepared, everybody. Uh, I am reading the first question, uh, which is a, a practical question. Right. Uh, and it is from Shaza, who is asking how to apply these ideas, especially open-endedness, hmm. with the rigorous curriculum. Uh, okay. Yeah, she's commenting right. on, a, on a paradigm shift that might be needed. In right, terms of right. Absolutely. Well, my, my suggestion is that we don't want to challenge that rigorous curriculum and demolish it and implode it, you know, completely. Because radical change, although it's very tempting, and I, I would love to be a revolutionary and rethink education completely, you know, from bottom up. That's why I work on the possible. But that will invite resistance. And, and not only invite resistance, but we don't, we shouldn't throw the baby with the dirty bathwater, you know, the expression. So there is something about structure that students should learn. There is something about valid knowledge that students should learn. You know, so there are so many, so many things we could keep from old curricula and the old ways of doing things. I think what Ron and I and others are, are thinking about is gradual change, you know, but the gradual change, all these moments of small creative openings, a bit of lesson and planning, a bit of structured uncertainty, uh, multiple pathways to get to the same place and so on. They need a change of mindset. So in order to, to enact them, you know, you, we need to think about creativity and possibility. We need to put them on the agenda of education. We cannot do it without, because otherwise we're going to do small little things and, and kind of try in the dark, but without a unifying philosophy. This for me could be, could be potentially one of, one of these philosophies. So, um, so I think starting, starting day by day and step by step, I, I know that it's probably not the most kind of... Um, yeah, inspiring advice, but, uh, but that's a, what, what I think is a realistic advice. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so there was um, a participant named Asdrubal that said uh -huh, that they have Asdrubal. a comment. So please feel free to just unmute yourself. And just in case I, yeah, let me just, oh, here we go. I'll ask you to unmute, there we go. Mm -hmm. ah, that's great. That Th uh, thank you. That, that's what I, I was asking to open the microphone. Vlad, thank you again. It's very inspiring to see you and nice to be in touch here by the through the screen. Okay, I hope for a magic to be at Creativity Week in person, okay, in June, but I, I don't know if that's going to happen. So the, just a comment, okay, about your presentation. It's, it comes, the, the possible comes to formul formulation or reformulation of problems again mm -hmm. okay and or or to solution or resolution of problems okay that that's how i see coming mm -hmm. back in the literature about uh, ab about creativity and moving forwards okay because you provoke us every time with your with what you your, with your ideas okay to uh, you your previous topic was mobility so mm. we go, we move right. in time and we move in space and we move in the literature to, <laughs> to reformulate the concept of creativity. If you can talk more about this now, that's okay. That was just a comment. Thank you. Right, right. Thank you, Azrubal. I hope I'm not confusing everyone with so many movements. I'm, I'm certainly uh, at risk of confusing myself with, with all of this. But I, I think that there is a kernel there is a, a unit, a, a kind of a central idea there. And, you know, when, when I, I, I name it possibility or the possible, for me, it starts to, to make sense, you know, all of these different directions. So you're right that I, 
I did talk about mobility and, and in a way you can infuse mobility into all of these different things. You know, how can we use movement, physical movement of ideas, online type of movements to cultivate open-endedness, non-linearity and so on and so forth, right? So, so I, I'm hoping <laughs> that this divergence can also lead to moments of convergence. And, and for me, any, any talk I give, and this is why I'm so happy to, to be talking to you, is an opportunity to kind of structure for the moment you know, uh, uh, an idea. And then that, that is a flexible structure. So at the next talk, God knows what I'm going to say. Hopefully, hopefully I'm going to build on what I'm saying already. But that, that's the beauty of, of, um, of, of life, really, in, in the area of the possible, that you can, you can always come back and, and um, yeah, enrich your thinking. But I, I, I appreciate the comment, thanks, and, and the patience <laughs> with me uh, changing topic all the time. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so there's another question about practical aspects. I think you mm -hmm. talked about some of them, but maybe you can highlight a right. little bit more. Uh, so this is from Maui, and she's asking, please, what type of classroom activities you think would nurture creativity among students and boost critical thinking? Okay, excellent question. You know, I actually had more slides, so I'm going to show you the three more slides I had because I thought, oh, we don't have time. But this is a question that that invites a practical answer, right? So look at that. I'm anticipating. I used future orientation for this one. So um, this is an, a, a small ex short experience I, I, I had in a local school in Switzerland called Ecole Germaine du Stel. Uh, it's a very, very small school. It's it's dedicated to kind of gifted students in some ways. It's it's a wonderful environment. And um, what we did was a small workshop called Geographies of Wonder. And the task was to randomly choose a place on earth. You can spin the globe and just put the finger or you can just blindfold yourself and, and touch the globe, right? And in small groups, students who are, who are quite young, you know, they were between six and 10 years of age, they had a task to help us experience that place on earth usually it was not in the ocean because that that becomes complicated so it was it was on land how does it feel like to be there and to live there do you see how there is an open-ended endedness to to this task alone so of course we helped them with other follow-up questions so they worked in groups they had a lot of resources they could they could have books and atlases and we were there to talk to them and they had art supplies and materials they had everything you, they need to um, to make us experience that place and we asked them what would we see if we were there what would we smell and touch or hear what what kind of land is that even geologically you know what kind of is it sand is it rock what 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 is it how is the sky how does it look like there you know is there is there water around what about plants and animals you know is there anything interesting about them what kind of people live there what languages would you hear speak how how do they sound those languages what would you bring if you had to visit what would you bring back you know from a visit so the the general procedure was that we explained the task you know between 5 10 minutes, we formed the groups, and then they had about 45 minutes to have this workshop uh, and, and to really look at any, any source of material they would have to help, help us give an experience of, of what it means to live in that place. So um, the presentations could be extremely creative. They could draw or make a collage. They could make a small theater performance. They could make a piece of installation art. You know, some did that. They can make a song or a poem. They were completely free, but the task was to make us experience that part of the world. So you see already, at, at least I think, that with this very small exercise, you accomplish so many things, right? In a traditional pedagogical view, they learn about geography, they learn about climate or about animals, about geology, about anything you know you can bring, about culture, a lot about culture and so on. They also learn to take perspectives. They take the perspective of someone who lives there. Uh, it's a very nonlinear process. We, we, we don't have a one outcome. We don't say, come with an essay of 200 words about you know, what it means to live in Kenya. Um, they, they have so many formats and it's all very interactive. You know? So um, it's a lot of fun. I think it's a, it's a, it's a great pedagogical experience. That's how, how we ran it one time because it was kind of in the pandemic and then uh, <laughs> we wait for, for us to be able to come back. So yeah, that, that's one example of a concrete experience. Great, thank you so much. Uh, is there anybody willing to make a comment or ask a question by unmuting themselves? If so, please let us know and just raise your hand and we will just ask you to unmute. 
in the meantime, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, okay, so um, uh, I work in a school in Croatia and we are always looking for uh, ways to connect with other schools who are also mm -hmm. interested in this type of work. So uh, my question is, you know, you just like brought a very concrete classroom example. Mm -hmm. So I thought, wouldn't it be great like if our school did something with that school, you know? So Absolutely. do you- like, do you Absolutely. know of schools, you know, in general, who might be? Mm -hmm. So, so you you have here uh, absolutely. I, I would definitely recommend to get in touch with uh, F. Marie Koller. Uh, and and if you go on the website of Ecole Germaine de Stel, you can you can take note of of the name. She's always very happy to to collaborate and to exchange on on issues of creative pedagogy. And I I work with her and her colleagues, you know, on on this topic. So um, I think one of the benefits of having uh, this whole forum, you know, and, and, and the work of Tazir of bringing us together so very often is that we could build a network if people are interested, where we try to, to design concrete tasks you know, within the curriculum, we don't have to explode the curriculum. We, we can put it within the curriculum that uh, that comply with these these generous principles uh, that yes. Ron and I talked about. Yeah. Yes, so, I'm game. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. The next Great. talk will be a, an international array of experiences, and uh, yeah, we we need to start somewhere. Great. <laughs> Adva, Adva has uh, has a raise yes. Hand. So I asked uh, Dr. Richard Cash to unmute, so he can go next, and then Dr. Adva can. We will ask you to unmute after that. So please, uh, um, Dr. Richard, go ahead. Thank you for the talk. This was great. Uh, I I'm sitting here and I'm just like in my glory because <laughs> when I was in school, I was not book smart, uh, mm -hmm. and I was very creative and wanted to make people laugh and was talented in that way and went through the pathway of theater. Yeah, and yeah, in yeah, my yeah. theater training, as you were explaining those, your pillars, I'm like, well, that's what we did in theater. Right, Everything right. was about the possibilities. And right, one right. of the things that, you know, as we start losing the arts because we're spending so much time on reading and math that we right. forget that reading and math are skills. And that without that without context, those mm. skills are meaningless. Mm. And right. we, we, we forget that the arts are what glorify us as human, as human beings. Right. And we've always used the arts to be possible. Mm. And so someone had mentioned, how do we how do we teach this? How do we teach critical thinking then? Well, if you just teach the arts, if you just teach Mm -hmm. improvisation as you were saying if you teach kids acting how mm -hmm. to be a different person how to create that person in three dimensions and and mm -hmm. you can take all of your curriculum and apply it right into theater theater teaches you problem solving what am i going to yeah. do if someone drops a line it teaches you critical thinking how do i get from point a to point b mm -hmm. it teaches you to be creative because if i'm playing uh, the Theseus in, in A Midsummer Night's Dream, I need to create that persona out of words. So right. uh, we, I, I, we should not be discounting the arts because the arts and exactly yeah. what you did here with the Geographies of Wonder mm -hmm. are encouraging kids to infuse the arts within the curriculum. Right. Because that is where we become possible. So absolutely, I just to make that absolutely. You know, it's it's a beautiful comment. Thank you so much. I mean, th this is exactly it. You know, we, we we didn't call it pedagogies, you know, artistic pedagogies, but they could be called that in so many ways, because I I think of course, and as you mentioned at the end, you know, we we don't want a firm dichotomy between art and science, whatever that is, right? So we want to infuse the art. We we need a, the mentalities and skill and skills and approaches of art and design and other 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 more immersive and creative uh, disciplines to go throughout the curriculum. This needs to be a transversal concern. It cannot be located within one, one subject. But having said that, absolutely, this, this goes exactly within those debates about the role of the arts in education. And, and then we need to show how the arts, you know, they tick all these boxes and more. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Adva, I think, right? Yes. <laughs> Uh, let me just ask you to unmute and that should be, oops. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So first of all, thank you so much, Vlad. It's 
always so it Thanks. always hearing you is so much empowering and inspiring oh. <laughs> and obviously obviously I want to join the net and be part of the group mm. and I want to tell you Nana that uh, along this uh, lockdown uh, mm. last year we had uh, we collaborate uh, between gifted uh, centers uh -huh. from here in Israel and if, with you in Croatia, gifted center from Zagreb. And mm. students, students worked on uh, finding an alternative for a human being on a moon, on the moon, since right. we, we are all in danger of, you know, losing our, <laughs> ourselves. So uh -huh. this was what they did as an alternative and it was really inspiring to see that uh, while they were locked in under lockdown in their home, right. they truly they did very well their collaboration and their their ideas were really inspiring. And I just want to say to you, Richard, that obviously uh, we speak about art and sciences. I'm coming from sciences, and we speak about this STEM idea of sciences, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics all coming all together with education and, uh, but also I think uh, Vlad, I was very uh, glad that you were mm -hmm. speaking about ethical issues right. and the right. fact that we need to take upon ourselves the um, uh, thinking of our values mm -hmm. while we are, while we are giving an alternative, there is not any alternative of uh, allowing any students to come up with his uh, opportunities and, and powerful issues into right. the classroom. Otherwise, we did nothing. And so I, I think that we truly have a lot to do. And also with uh, how uh, new, uh, student teachers and new teachers are uh, treating their own job, not as, um, you know, giving up, giving what they're delivering their knowledge, but um, I would say imparting their uh, ability to think mm. uh, on new perspective, and I think we should we should uh, deliver these new ideas into the future. Right. So right. thank you so much, Vlad, for okay. doing that. For us. Thank you, thank you, Advain, and for raising yet another very interesting, just small activity that can go a yeah. long way, right? We're thinking about being yeah. on the moon and the challenges. We we need more of this lateral yeah. thinking in education. <laughs> Absolutely. Obviously. Thank you. I do agree. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know that I went well overboard with what I wanted to say, and I'm sorry. We're I think we're we're running out of time, but I'm going to. Every let... word was very important to hear. So <laughs> don't you apologize, please. It was crucial. <laughs> I I I you know I talk a lot, but I I can also just you know in case in case we're close to ending, just to to tell you that um, if you want to know more about these you know um, different topics, we do have a, a network called Possibility Studies Network. So it's the possibilitystudies.org website, and we'll have the first international conference of possibility studies. Will be online because you know that's where we live, ten to thirteen. Of May and and it's free of charge and you can just register. Um, I can I can maybe put these details in the chat. Let mm -hmm. me see if I can copy and put them in the mm -hmm. chat. And uh, I would be very happy to to see some of you there. Um, so yeah, that's here we go. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Uh, there was also a question about the availability of the presentation. So uh -huh. just in right. case you- Yeah, it will be available. I, I'm, I'm happy to send it to Tazir, I think, right? And, and uh, well, I actually already sent it to Tazir so he can, <laughs> he can just share it. <laughs> Great, so I wrote down the emails for everybody who said that would be interested in this international collaboration. So if anyone else hasn't yet, uh, put in their email and wants to participate, please do so. And also Lani is asking about recording. And yes, ICIE has its own uh, YouTube channel and all the recordings are usually available uh, out there. So Absolutely. I think I will uh, give it away to Professor Taisir. <laughs> okay, thank you. And I am happy to see all of you here today. So first of all, thank God to uh, Many thanks go to my friend Vlad for this interesting, uh, innovative, and uh, 
very practical uh, talk. Uh, we highly appreciate your continuous contributions. Uh, and we are looking forward to meeting with you in our future international events like this. Mm -hmm. Also, many thanks goes, uh, or many thanks go to my friends and colleagues who joined us today, uh, even 